Great. So let's talk about news vendors problem. So it's a stochastic optimization problem as we discussed in the previous class. The problem is in the morning a news vendor has to go buy X number of newspapers. In the afternoon or evening he's going to sell uh, Y number of newspapers and then he's left with some W number of newspapers that he needs to go and return uh, back to the newspaper agency. And the goal of the news vendor is to maximize its profit okay, or minimize its uh, total cost. Uh, you know the this problem even though it's called a news vendors problem it's much more generally applicable wherever you need to stock up items and then you need to sell it over a period of time so it's very much useful in most of the uh, commercial enterprise uh, in today's world okay so oh, you switch the problem description from maximize profit to minimize total cost right uh, those aren't directly equivalent because if we want to minimize total cost um, so it's cost minus revenue okay yeah so cost minus revenue so profit is revenue minus cost so the cost that I'm saying total cost is cost minus revenue okay so so the first thing is we want to uh, formulate by the way the, why is this problem important well of course it's important because it's applicable but Warren Buffet who is one of the most richest person on the planet used to be a news vendor at some point of time, okay, in 1950s. <laughs> so, uh, so, so he probably solved this problem long time back and he knew how to make it work to maximize his profit. So the problem is I want to minimize CX minus PY minus RZ or I'll put omega in terms of in front of y and in front of z. So let me define these terms. C is the cost of one newspaper. P is the selling price. Uh, R is the return price. Uh, X is the number of newspapers to buy. Y of omega is the number of newspapers to sell. And Z of omega is number of newspapers to return. Okay, so this is my revenue and this is my cost <clears throat> okay and what is omega omega is the number of customers number of customers buying the newspaper. And the question we want to think is, uh, what are the constraints in this problem? Okay. So we have formulated the problem. What are the constraints? Sorry, we have formulated the objective function, but we now need to know what the constraints are. Y omega plus Z omega equals X. Well, I'm going to make it less than equal to X because I can choose not to return the newspapers. Okay. Okay. Uh, we also need, of course, Y of omega, 
greater than equal to 0 z of omega greater than equal to 0 x greater than equal to 0. Well, omega is the number of customers buying the newspaper. So, you will have the set omega, which will probably be 0 to whatever. Yeah, so how is that not a constraint we need to list just like x? Oh, so, so this set is something that's given by nature. You don't define what this set is. It's not your decision variable that participates in the optimization okay. problem. It's part of the formulation. Oh, that's the random variable that yeah. will then do the expectation. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Okay, so these are not decision variables. Now, I want to make an assumption here to simplify the uh, problem. The assumption is that the price is strictly greater than C, cost which is strictly greater than R, which is strictly greater than 0. Okay. It's a reasonable assumption because uh, the price of the newspaper has to be strictly greater than cost, otherwise nobody will sell newspapers. And the cost of the newspaper is, should be strictly greater than R, otherwise I can buy newspaper, return it immediately and make a profit. Right? So, and then of course the return price has to be greater than zero, otherwise uh, people are going to just waste the newspapers. Yes. So with how the news vendor problem is set up so that the newspaper is it has no value at the end of the day, mm -hmm. why are we assuming they wouldn't return them, which would make the uh, inequality for y omega plus c omega be a strict equality? Yeah, so if you assume that, so you can of course solve it for the case where r equals zero, where this term is just going to drop out. And then you just have this optimization problem. Oh, okay. You see what I'm saying? That's meant to tolerate that, okay. Yeah. Then you will have one less decision variable to worry about. Okay, so this is how uh, we are setting up the problem. Uh, what was other important thing? Okay, omega has a CDF. Omega has probability density function F and CDF capital F. So capital F of X equals not X, X is already used. Let me just write it as f of a is minus infinity or 0, 0 to a, f of omega d omega. Okay, so one, one cheating that I'm doing is I'm assuming that newspaper is a real valued, number of newspapers is a real valued variable, not a discrete variable, that just to be able to solve this problem analytically. Okay, so it's a real valued. So number of newspapers is a real valued number. Okay, <clears throat> is the problem set up clear? Okay, so now that the problem is has been set up, I want to get some ideas about how to go about solving this problem. So what do you think? I mean, this is a dynamic decision problem. Okay, there are two stages. Stage one, you go buy newspapers. Stage two, you sell newspapers and return newspapers. Okay, so this is a dynamic problem. Um, I, want to, I want you to think and tell me how exactly I should go ahead and solve this problem. What do we know about dynamic optimization problems? If we want to solve for optimal strategy, what do we do? Yes. Yeah, it's a dynamic programming problem. So what do we do in dynamic programming? We solve for the final stage problem first, right? That's what we have studied for dynamic programming. So step one to solve this problem is to look at the second stage problem, okay? So we are going to split this optimization problem into two stages, stage two problem and then stage one problem. 
we look at the stage 2 problem first, solve it, then insert the value function in the stage 1 problem and then solve stage 1 problem. Don't we also need to decide a, which optimization technique we're going to use to take care of the randomness? Risk neutral, risk sensitive? So, oh, oh, uh, sorry, there is going to be an expectation in the front. So it's risk not, neutral. yeah, it's risk neutral. Uh, I Maybe there are risk sensitive version of this as well, but I just don't know about it. Well, it's not well studied. Uh -huh. if, if it's a paper extra, maybe you'd want to do that, but not day to day. Yeah. Uh, okay. And the minimization is being performed over x, y, and z. So these are the three decision variables here. So this is a two-stage stochastic program with recourse. Okay, and the reason for this word recourse is at the second stage, we still have some decision variables that we can, that we need to choose. So there is a way to correct any mistakes we might have made in the past. Okay, so this is a two-stage stochastic programming with recourse. We'll apply dynamic programming. Stage two problem. Okay, so look at the stage two problem first. In the stage two problem definition, I'm going to collect all the terms that involves omega. Okay, because omega gets realized in stage two. So I need to collect all the terms that uh, that involves omega, so I have min of expected value of minus p y omega minus r z omega such that y of omega plus z of omega minimize over y omega to r z omega to r Okay, um, what I'm going to do is, I'm going to solve the problem inside the expectation for every value of omega, okay? So what I'm going to do is remove the expectation and solve the problem and plug in the y star and z star, whatever we will find in the expectation in order to compute the value of stage two problem, v of x. Okay, so this is, this is what we want to find. This is what we want to find. This is the future expected cost to go once we do the optimization at the second stage. So let me write it as future expected value assuming we act optimally in stage two. Okay, this is exactly similar to the dynamic programming we have done earlier, except that we are taking into account the randomness that will be realized in stage two, and taking into account the constraints that we need to, uh, that we need to uh, ensure in those stages, in that particular stage. Okay, any questions so far? Yes. So uh, just to clarify, uh, for this problem format, uh, I'll, we, we'll just apply the linearity of expectation through to pull out the constants. And then when we're looking at, at the expectation of y omega and the expectation of z omega, those will be finite valued given x. Why do you say finite valued? They may not be finite valued. Because oh, well, finite as in 
you, uh, yeah, I think, yeah, so it will be finite valued, yes. Okay. Yeah, it will be less than or equal to x, of course. Uh, well, the expectation of y omega is a constant of r omega. Yeah, once you take the expectation, then omega is, is okay. lost. Yep. Okay, any questions so far? Okay. So in order to get the value of v of x, I am going to define q of x comma omega as min over y and z minus p y omega minus r z omega such that y omega plus z omega is less than or equal to x There is no x, right? There is no x. Why? Because I have, I am only considering the terms in the cost function and in the constraints that involves omega. So this term doesn't involve omega. No. And this constraint doesn't involve omega. Oh, I see. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I've, I've left those two constraints out of the picture. I have a question about the setting. Yeah. yeah. So once omega is determined, so we, we can find the y here. Right? Yes. This means like there's a 10, 10 people want to buy the, buy the newspaper, we can just uh, offer five to them. Does it, I think, like, why is not that the parameter we can control if the omega is determined? So if, so if there is a deterministic demand that you know, because like 100 households are going to buy the newspaper on a daily basis, it will just move the omega to the right. You see the omega is going to start from 100. Okay, so so it can be taken into account. Uh, this it's a very pretty general setup. So why is this minimization over y? Because when you take the expectation over all the omega, it would be just constant value, right? Yeah. Okay. So uh, you, so you are asking a very important question. So remember that y, the decision variable y and z, are made once omega is realized once the demand is realized. Okay, so when you are uh, taking the expectation of this whole thing subject to these stochastic, so these constraints have to be met for every value of omega. Okay, so once you take the minimization, since y is a function of omega, I don't need to consider this expectation in the sense that if it was not a function of omega, but something which is uh, a random variable, then I'll have to take a conditioned, conditional expectation, and that will screw up the problem. In the sense that it will become very difficult to solve the problem. It may even become impossible to solve the problem in that situation. Because you don't know whether this constraint will be met for all possible realizations of the information variable. Okay, so this is a much simpler setup where the information is entire omega itself. Okay, and not a function of omega, which sort of hides some amount of information. Uh, so here is my question. So when you take the expectation, expectation of y omega is going to be a constant. Right? Yes, it's going to be a constant. Uh, and then based on that, I can always choose z. Uh, I mean, I can always change my x to satisfy that constraint y plus z is equal to x. Uh, okay, so you have already purchased x amount of newspaper, so you can't go back and redo the thing, okay? Um, what, so in this particular problem, in the morning, you need to estimate the demand that's going to appear in the afternoon and then buy the newspapers accordingly. But once you have bought the newspaper, if the when afternoon comes, then you just have to sell it according to Omega. You don't have a way to change that, okay? Change your X variable uh, in the morning. 
So that's the causality constraint, right? You can't do that. Unless you are Christopher Nolan, you can go back in time, do a lot of stuff, come back in the future and whatever. Okay, so, so the reason why I could remove the expectation and just consider the optimization problem inside is because y and z are functions of omega. It's also a function of omega here. Let me just write it. And now I want to solve this minimization problem. So what do you think would be the solution? What is the optimal y omega, y star omega, and z star omega? Okay, so first of all, since P is greater than R, so I'm going to apply my intuition to solve this problem. Of course, you can solve it more rigorously. So since P is greater than R, if, the, if omega amount of customers come, I should sell all the newspapers to them, right? That's what is going to maximize my total profit, okay? Or minimize this negative of profit or negative of revenue. So my Y star of omega is going to be min of x comma omega. And my z star of omega would be max of 0 and x minus omega. Okay, so let's uh, look at the solution. The solution is saying that if I have omega amount of customers, I will sell all the newspapers until the number of customers exceed x. Okay, once it exceeds x, I can only sell x amount of newspapers. I cannot sell anything beyond that. Now, how many newspapers are left? Well, I have x minus omega amount of newspapers, so I should return that because r is strictly greater than zero. So I shouldn't just throw it away, I should go back and return those newspapers, right? But there could be a situation uh, where x minus omega is negative, which means that the number of customers are more than the number of newspapers I have, in which case, of course, I will sell all the newspapers and return zero newspapers, okay? So that's the optimal solution in the case of this news vendors problem. Okay, everyone agrees with it? Okay, so I should sell as many newspapers as I can and I should return all the remaining newspapers back to the uh, agency. So now the time is ripe to compute the value function, which is just the expectation of Q. So my V of X is expected value of Q X comma omega, which is equal to negative P min X comma omega f omega d omega minus r integral of max 0 x minus omega f of omega d omega. Okay, that's a pretty horrible integral. But actually we can simplify it. Okay, so I'm going to, this is zero to infinity, zero to infinity. So I can simplify this integral as follows. So this is equal to minus P zero to X 
omega f omega d omega minus p x to infinity x f omega d omega minus r 0 to x x minus omega minus r multiplied by 0. Okay, this so this step is fairly clear. We am just computing the expectation by plugging in y star omega and z star omega that I found in the expression for the objective function at stage two, and then I am just uh, breaking up the integral into two parts, zero to x and x to infinity, because then I can compute these values exactly. And now I am going to collect all the terms together. Um, and what I get is, so this is 0, I have minus p minus r 0 to x omega small f omega d omega minus minus p x a integral x to infinity f omega d omega minus r x integral 0 to x f omega d omega. Okay, can we simplify the expression further? Okay, so what is this? What is this equal to? Capital F of X. What is this term equal to? One minus capital F of X. What is this equal to? That's a complicated question. Okay, so all, how many of you know integration by parts? I hope everyone. Integration by parts. Okay, so let's apply integration by parts to do this, to evaluate this integral. Okay, now you are seeing why calculus is so important. Okay. So integration by part says I have integral of f g prime equals to f g minus integral of f prime g. Okay. So I can write integral from 0 to x of omega f omega d omega as 0 to x omega f prime omega d omega and this leads us to the integral omega f omega minus integral of f omega d omega evaluated at x minus 0 and this is equal to 
x f x minus integral 0 to x f omega d omega. Okay, so I can simplify these this expression even further, uh, and let us do that. Yes. So the, the integral uh, over or capital F omega uh, is functionally equivalent to negative infinity to x. Next, but just in this problem, we yes, know because we are yeah. So yeah. what, from a phenomenon perspective, does the integral of the CDF from negative infinity to x actually mean? So the thing is, you can extend this function capital F all the way from minus infinity to plus infinity, mm -hmm. but it is going to take a value of zero from minus infinity to zero, and only yeah. then it's going to start increasing. Yeah. So even if you consider the integral from minus infinity to x, you can. I, I understand that. I, w what I'm saying is, is the integral of a CDF uh -huh. from negative infinity to x, what phenomenon is that modeling? Or is it just some mathematical contrivance that this problem happens to require? It doesn't have a phenomenological counterpart. I don't think it has any, I'm, I'm trying to think. I, I don't think it has any phenomenon. <laughs> that long word counterpart. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it, but but what's the operational meaning? Yeah. Yeah, that's what he's saying. You know, I think there is some operational meaning to one minus f x one minus capital F x zero to x d omega. No, not zero to x, but zero to some value between. Yeah, zero to x. Uh, that's the expectation, right? Yeah, that's the expectation. You see what I'm saying? No. no. So integral of 1 minus fx dx from 0 to 0 to x. 0 to x or 0 to infinity? infinity. 0 to infinity is expected value of x. Okay. Okay. I haven't seen that definition of it before. Yeah, so this is an equivalent definition of expected value. But this one, I don't know what it means. OK, anyway, this is not important. I mean, important, but not part of this discussion. So let's uh, expand all these terms. So I have minus p minus r, x fx minus p minus r or plus p minus r integral 0 to x f omega d omega minus p x plus p minus r x f x. Okay, is everyone comfortable with this expression? Okay, we have another cancellation. This term cancels with this term. And now we get the value function v of x as minus px plus p minus r f omega d omega.
Okay. Is that a cumulative cumulative distribution function? Oh uh, yeah, you can probably. <laughs> this is cumulative cumulative distribution function. Yeah, I think that's a good word for it. Maybe you can find some operational meaning to what cumulative cumulative distribution function. Okay. Uh, now what do I have to do? Okay, so remember dynamic programming says I need to solve the second stage problem first, find the value function. So in this case, so in the case of deterministic optimization problem, uh, finding the value function was not a problem because you didn't have to compute expectation, right? There was no uncertainty anywhere. Now because you have uncertainty, you have to compute the expectation. Okay, so that's an additional burden, uh, but we went through it, we were able to compute the expectation, so this is my expected value of q x comma omega. And this q comes from here. Okay, now what's the next step of dynamic programming? Add it to the current stage cost function and then minimize it. So Stage one optimization problem. Is I want to minimize x greater than or equal to zero, cx plus vx. So this is the same problem as minimize x greater than or equal to zero. C minus P X plus P minus R integral zero to X F omega D omega. Okay, that's our stage one problem that we need to solve. How do we solve it? Yeah. First order. So you are saying that the first order condition is sufficient? No, first order and second order. Okay, first order and second order. So we need to check first order and second order condition here uh, to solve this problem, right? So everyone agrees with that, right? Uh, you know, it will turn out, I mean, I'm going to prove it uh, now, that this is actually a convex objective function. Okay, it's not apparent because x appears in the integral as a limit of the integral, but it's a convex function in x, so let's prove that. I'm going to erase this part. Yes. Okay, so if I take the first derivative with respect to x of c minus p x plus integral, this is equal to c minus p plus fx. Okay. O P minus R, yes, P minus R. Okay, so that's the first derivative. Let's take the second derivative of this whole thing. That's zero plus P minus R f of x, which is greater than or equal to 0 for all x in R. Okay, does that make sense? So 
So even though we started with a linear objective function, there was some nonlinearity in the value function because of the expectation uh, that we took. And then when we add it to the stage one cost function, it turns out that it still remains convex. Okay, so this problem remains convex uh, because we checked the second derivative and it turned out to be non-negative. So now I, all I have to do is set the first derivative equal to zero and that gives me the optimal x star. So I have c minus p plus p minus r fx star equals to zero. So this is first order necessary condition. And this gives me f of x star equals p minus c over p minus r, x star equals to f inverse p minus c over p minus r. Okay, that's a very elegant answer. Okay, so now if you were a news vendor, those are the number of newspapers you need to buy in the morning. Okay, and over a very long period of time, that will optimize your profit. Not, op yeah, that, is, that will maximize. So the long run average will be equal to the expected value and that will maximize your profit, yeah. So if you're the local distributor of like the New York Times for your location, this works? Yes, Not if this works. Not the newsboy on the corner? Uh, no, it will work for the newsboy on the corner as well. As long as, so what is the assumption here? The assumption is Omega is independent on an everyday basis. So it's not the same set of people coming and going every day. So it'll work for New York Times, It'll work for um, the news vendor on the corner, both of them. Oh, so it, it's if, if you're selling them every day, no yeah. subscription. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So let's see how you would find this value. So you plot your f of x as a function of x. So you will have something like this. Okay. This is your one. And you know all these parameters, P, C, R, you know this. So this will be your P minus C over P minus R, strictly less than one. This is your X star, okay? This is your F inverse P minus C, P minus R. Okay? So this is a risk neutral optimization problem. We have a two state stochastic programming problem. Uh, there is a recourse variable y and z, which basically captures the fact that in the second stage, there is some decision to be made. Isn't that going to be strictly negative? Because Why? c is greater than p. No, p is greater than c is greater than r, greater than zero. Oh, sorry, yeah. Okay. Okay, so in the second stage you have y and z, those are the two decision variable. Assuming that you are going to act optimally in the second stage, you compute the value function, and by taking the expectation of the second stage uh, optimal q function, you compute the value function, you plug it in the first stage optimization problem, you solve, that optimization problem, and then you get the optimal solution to the first stage problem. So the overall optimal solution will be given by these three, uh, these three uh, uh, equations. So these are the strategy in stage two. And this is, of course, the strategy in stage one. Okay. 
Okay, so dynamic programming is useful even in this problem in a two-stage stochastic programming problem. Yes, yes. And the policy depends on the Yes. So, yes, so x becomes the state in the next stage. So even though I have written it as y star omega and z star omega, it's actually a function of x. Okay, so x becomes the state in the second stage problem. Of course, it has to be different in different stage. So how to, how to rest the vector u in the dynamic So, okay, so that's a good point. So you have x0 equals to 0, x1 equals x0 plus whatever, well, whatever this x is, x star, and then your u2 is equal to y and z. That's your control action. Of course, yeah, u1 is just x star. That's your u1. So that's the decision variable in the first stage. And these are the two decision variables in the second stage. Right? And the state update equation is pretty u0 equals to x star, x0 plus u0. Okay, so, yeah. So, uh, uh, with the problem solution you gave, is there anything that pre prevents us from saying r equals zero, so there's no point in resale? Uh, the way you wrote the inequality chain up says that r is supposed to be greater than zero. So, what would that change in the model? So, first of all, your z star will be equal to, so his question is what happens when r is equal to zero? So, z star will be equal to zero because you don't really care about uh, returning those newspapers. And then, of course, the integral of v, the, the expectation of q of x omega is going to change. So some of the terms will drop out in the integral. Well, what, what I'm asking with x star, would it just be a capital F, F inverse, or is p minus c divided by p? Uh, I am, so I'll have to go through the derivation again, because uh, where did I use the fact that r is strictly positive? Did I use it anywhere? No, I don't think I've used the fact that R is positive anywhere except for computing this value of Z star omega. Yeah. So I guess you are right that if R is equal to zero, I can write it as P minus C over P. Okay. That would be the optimal solution. Uh, does this problem easily generalize into you know, uh, multiple variables? Like if you're not the news, not, not the news vendor's problem, but like a fishmonger's problem um, where, where you have a certain amount of revenue for the day, or you have a certain amount to invest in inventory for the day, what products do you buy uh, using a model like this? Uh, see, the, 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 the topic of stochastic programming is pretty huge, and a lot of problems have been studied in this area, um, including insurance, right? So in the first time step, you pay for some insurance. In the second time step, you get some disease or whatever and you get money back from the insurance to pay for the uh, pay to the doctors right so that's also a two-stage stochastic programming with three cores okay and the omega term is how much money each of you will be claiming from the insurance agency and x would be what's the price of the insurance that the insurance company sets right so so what I'm saying is that this idea of stochastic programming, and you could have multi-state stochastic programming, which again, you have to apply dynamic programming and solve it. So this idea is pretty general. It has been studied in a lot of domains. So no matter what problem formulation you have in mind, I can assure you that there will be at least five papers written on that topic, which you can check by going to Google Scholar, okay? Uh, if it is not, then that's a good research topic for you, okay? Uh, so. Anyways, I'll give you the, the general way to solve a two-stage stochastic program, and you can generalize it to multi-stage problem. So I have to minimize f1 of x1 
plus expected value of f2 of x1, x2 omega such that h of x1 equal to 0 and h2 of x1 x2 omega equals to 0. This minimization is with respect to x1 and x2 as a function from omega to r. So you know the uncertainty when you are choosing x2. Then this problem needs to be divided into two problems. So the first problem is stage 2 optimization problem where you minimize f2 of x1 x2 omega and omega such that store this as a Q function. So basically collect all the terms that involves omega, write that problem as stage two problem, solve the stage two problem, compute V of X1 equals expected value of Q of X1 comma omega. That's your step two. And then you solve stage one optimization problem, which is minimize with respect to x1 Now if you have multi-stage problem, you solve the stage 3 problem, compute the Q function, compute the value function, then plug it into the stage 2 problem, solve it, then plug in the value function in the stage 1 problem and so on. Okay? So this method can be generalized to any number of stages. Uh, the only way, I mean of course, the way to solve these problems is you need to know what the distribution over the uncertainty is. Okay? If you don't know the distribution over uncertainty, then of course you have to collect data, figure out what the distribution is and all that. And, and nowadays a lot of machine learning problems are trying to do exactly that. So while you are discovering omega, can you... So you still have to solve this problem, but you don't quite know what the distribution over omega is. So somehow you solve the problem, estimate the distribution, then solve the problem again estimate the distribution and all that. So there's an iterative procedure through which you try to solve this problem, estimate the distribution in the process, then again redo the problem again, estimate the distribution again. Over a period of time you accumulate some regret and uh, people are basically using what is known as reinforcement learning to, uh, to estimate um, or, or rather to make sure that your overall regret over a long period of time is as low as possible. So, um, so yeah. So, so, so there is quite a bit of uh, uh, quite a bit of research happening, even in, uh, in 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 this field where the distribution over omega is not known or is changing slowly over time. You know, I was I, and I'll tell you another story. I was at the Nationwide uh, talking to some folks from Nationwide. And they said that because of all this global warming, the, the traditional distribution on how many forest fires will happen, how many floods will happen, how many typhoons will occur, and all that stuff, all that distribution is changing. And it's changing pretty rapidly. It's not like they have 100 years of data, and that's going to tell us what's going to happen in the next 10 years. It's changing every year. And, and they are trying to estimate what the distribution is going to be so that they can get they can price their insurance products accordingly. Okay? 
So it's not really a vacuous problem, okay? It really is something that some companies are working very hard to, to solve. So anyways, that's all I have for today. We'll talk about MDPs on Monday.